Greetings everyone. Welcome to Naranayas. This is a part of daily news analysis in which we select various articles from the Hindu and Indian Express and do a detailed analysis. The topics that we have selected from the Indian Express and the Hindu are as follows. Firstly, it's time to revamp the structure of the Supreme Court in which we look into how we could revamp the structure of the Supreme Court to see that the adjudication of constitutional and non-constitutional cases is done in an efficient as well as that is in an efficient and objective manner it is from the hindu page number 6 then growing more from less is an article that tries to show how productivity of the agriculture could be improved through the usage of technology as well as latest ways in terms of seed development or providing proper irrigation facilities etc it is from the indian express page number 15 Third, surplus liquidity normalization, robust credit growth, bolstered monetary policy transmission in which we are going to see how RBI is effectively utilizing various monetary policy tools to control the inflation rate in the economy successfully. This is from the Indian Express, page number 13. Next, Election Commission tells KCR government to stop Farm Aid cites Model Code of Conduct. So, Model Code of Conduct is one of the mechanisms through which we will see how the Election Commission utilizes the code to see that the elections are conducted in a free and fair manner, especially prior to the polling day, where the campaigning is done by various political parties. It is from the Indian Express, page number 7. Last one, the mechanism that removes unfit cell before you are born, where we will see a defense mechanism through which unfit cells within the embryo are uh, defended from their attack on the embryo by particular virus. This is from the Hindu page number science column. Now, let us begin our analysis with the first article. This article deals about the need for restructuring the Supreme Court. There is a lot of subjectivity involved in deciding the constitution benches or non-constitutional benches that deal with various cases. The cases might be constitutional and non-constitutional. Constitutional cases is the name itself refers to deals with the cases that require to examine the provisions of the constitution or cases that requires whether these are following the provisions of the constitution. And this is an important task why because this country needs to be run as per the provisions of the constitution. Non-constitutional cases deal with ordinary legal matters. Of course, some are of national importance, some aren't of national importance. In this article, we will see why there is a need for revamping the structure of the Supreme Court so as to deliver justice effectively and also improve the ability to see that the constitutional cases are dealt effectively. Why? Because presently we are not dealing with the constitutional cases as they should have been. The title of the article is, It's time to revamp the structure of the Supreme Court. Relevance, judicial reforms, structural changes in the judiciary. And Main's perspective, it is important to deal with the judiciary. The previous year questions, desirability of greater representation of women in higher judiciary or tribunals, which refers to tribunalization of judiciary. Next, Supreme Court judgment on National Judicial Appointment Commission Act 2014, etc. Many such important cases or importance with regards to the Supreme Court or judiciary are important. Why? Because they have been asked repeatedly in UPSC mains examination. The context is the CJI Chandrachud has announced the, his intent to create constitutional benches of varied strength as a permanent feature. And he wants to create a constitutional benches. And the constitutional bench which has varied strengths ranging from 5 to 7 to 9 to the max and deal with the constitutional matters. And this is a permanent feature. Why he is trying to incorporate such changes is to improve our dealings with the constitutional issues. And what are the constitutional benches? These are specialized panels that deal with the constitutional matters that involve substantial question of the law and matters of constitutional importance. That is how they are defined. Formation of constitutional benches. Chief Justice of India is a master of roast in formation of the constitutional benches. That is, he decides the various judges 
who are to preside over these cases. So that leads to higher discretion power with the Chief Justice of India in deciding the judges who are supposed to preside over the proceedings of particular case, on the basis of particular case. And that's what happens is, depending upon the inclination of judges, we could also predict the outcome of the judgment. That shouldn't be the case. But that is what one of the issues that present Supreme Court is facing. That why should Chief Justice of India be the master of roster? And the minimum, as we already seen, is 5 to maximum larger pens 9. And it is covered under Article 145.3. And the judges are generally selected on a particular basis. The basis has expertise, seniority and relevance to particular constitutional matter. Though these are the parameters that we generally include or take into account while composing, while deciding the composition of the particular bench, yet the discretion with the Chief Justice of India is far higher. And the thing is that there is a registry under the CJS instructions which assigns the cases to these constitutional benches. Now, why is the issue with this particular Supreme Court structure? The mixed case load. The thing is that the Supreme Court deals with not only the constitutional cases but non-constitutional cases. Together, they become such an overload as a task to the Supreme Court that its ability to complete the proceedings and decide on the case outcomes becomes a complex issue. And constitutional matters are of importance to this country, not only to the citizens but also how the government functions. But yet they are taking a lot of time. And Supreme Court has the paucity of time in deciding the constitutional cases because it has to deal with the overload of cases. And that is why presently 79,813 cases are pending in the Supreme Court. Next is the number of cases within these cases, that is number of constitutional cases within these cases are lower. If you look at the number in the year 2022, only 4 of the 1,263 decisions deal with the constitutional bench. That is, it is a fraction of cases. Despite having the urgency or need to deal with the constitutional cases, we are unable to do it. The other issues are discretion in bench formation with the Chief Justice of India, which we have already seen, and subjectivity in case assignment. That is, somehow we could also decide the outcome on the basis of the composition of the bench and composition is decided by the Chief Justice of India. Even if Chief Justice of India doesn't, or in the future, if he doesn't uh, decide the composition of these uh, benches, if he's not a master of roster, you have to see that there is a particular criteria through which we could assign a case to the benches and then see that it is not subjective. It is dependent upon various parameters that are objective in nature on the basis of the merit. What are the recommendations for structural changes? The reason for the recommendation of the structural changes that we are referring to is to see that the constitutional cases happen as frequently as possible as per the requirement of the country. So, there are certain recommendations given by law commissions as well as case laws of the Supreme Court. One such recommendation is given by 10th Law Commission which stated that Supreme Court should be split into two divisions one, the constitutional division, and the other is legal division. As the name itself suggests, one deals with the constitutional matter, the other non-constitutional matters. Like, for example, Supreme Court also has the task as highest court of appeal. So, whatever the decisions that are taken by the high court could be appealed to the Supreme Court. On the, that depends upon certain uh, conditions that are enshrined in the constitution. Those appeals should be heard by the Supreme Court that because the constitution envisions it, the constitution directs the Supreme Court to do it. So that task is also be undertaken. But presently as you, we have seen in the past slide, the constitutional issues dealt with the Supreme Court are far lower, which have to be included and one of the ways through which we could do it is this recommendation. Then in the case Bihar Legal Support Society versus Chief Justice of India 1986, Supreme Court has said that it is desirable to establish National Court of Appeal. As we have seen, the cases that are appealed in the Supreme Court are far higher. And these are, take the time 
of the Supreme Court mostly. That is, Supreme Court mostly utilizes its time in dealing with the cases that are appealed from the High Court. So, this judgment shows the intent to create National Court of Appeal to reduce the case load. Because to reduce the time that Supreme Court takes in uh, completing the proceedings or adjudication of the non-constitutional cases. And 229th Law Commission Report 2009 has recommended to establish four regional benches in Delhi, Chennai or Hyderabad, Kolkata and Mumbai. So these regional benches deal with the matters same like Supreme Court. And why there is a need for creating these divisional benches is to see that the justice is accessible to different regions of the country. What pattern that we are witnessing in this country is most of the appeals that happen to the Supreme Court are from the regions which are closer to the Supreme Court. The states like Punjab, Haryana, etc. These are the regions in which the High Court judgments are appealed in the Supreme Court in a greater manner when compared to others. Thus, we are denying the access of justice to different regions like South, West, etc. And if we apply these regional benches, we will reduce distance being one of the criteria to avail justice in this country. And we could also see that the appeal, that is appellate jurisdiction, which is with the Supreme Court, because it is the highest court of appeal, it could do the task more efficiently at the same time in a greater magnitude when compared to having one Supreme Court at the center. And it will also set to constitute constitutional bench in the New Delhi to take care of the constitutional cases. So in this way, Supreme Court could deal with both the constitutional cases as well as non-constitutional cases. Merits of structural changes in the Supreme Court. Firstly, specialized attention could be given because special at attention can be given to critical constitutional cases because these structural changes will enable the Supreme Court to deal with the constitutional cases in greater magnitude than was the case earlier. And specialization and expertise. We could have specialized benches which have the expertise to deal with various constitutional matters. As you have seen, allocation of the cases to the benches which is composed of judges is to be selected on the basis of the merit and depending upon the constitutionality of the case, we could assign the case to the benches and thus we could use the expertise to deal with these cases. Next is efficiency in adjudication. Now because we have expertise and allocation is on the objective grounds, then obviously what we could expect is efficiency to, in dealing with these cases. Thus adjudication of the matter will be done in a better manner. Next coherence in judgment that is consistency rather than relying upon the inclination of the judges. Here we, we I'm, uh, here we are not suggesting that the quality of the judges differentiate from one another. The way they come to the conclusion varies from one judge to the another. There is an element of subjectivity in deciding the, a particular case that ultimately depends upon how a particular judge interprets the law or interprets various values that he or she takes into account while evaluating a particular case. But ultimately, what we are dealing with is the quality. The quality could be ensured if we reduce subjectivity. The cogency, that is the conclusion, is it is imperative to restructure the Supreme Court. Why? Because we have to segregate functions, the constitutional as well as non-constitutional cases and deal with them effectively. At the same time, we have to see that we reduce the subjectivity, that is our values. If, if an individual is judged, his or her value should not be a deciding criterion to decide the final outcome of the judgment. And streamline adjudication, that is it has to be streamlined, it has to be objective, it has to have a particular framework within which allocation of the cases is to be done and reduce the dependency on discretionary powers, for example in this case the Chief Justice of India. So in this way, Supreme Court could function effectively and efficiently and reduce the case loads and deal with more case load in the future. This completes the article. Now let us look into another article.
The article is on agriculture. How the technology in agriculture could lead to significant enhancement in production and income levels of the farmers. As you know, farming is in crisis with respect to stagnation of income levels and its contribution to the overall GDP in India. For that, we require innovative ways. We have already seen many innovations in the past that led to rise in production of agricultural produces like seed, like rice, wheat, etc. Similarly, we have various technologies that have developed over a period of time that also improved our ability to produce more. In this article, we are going to see the past technologies that have led to the rise and the way forward, how we could actually overcome the issues that agriculture is facing, thus improve our overall production levels. The title of the article is Producing More from Less. It in itself shows increasing the productivity. Okay, The production is to be improved despite having less input. Why? Presently, the input that we are putting into the production in agriculture is higher. That is why it is becoming unviable. What we require is use less inputs yet getting higher outputs thus making agriculture a viable occupation. The title of the article is Producing More From Less. The relevance of the topic, factors of production in agriculture. So we are going to learn about various inputs that could improve the production and role of various technologies. Relevance of the topic from UPSC point of view, GS paper 3, technology for the aid of farmers. The context is Niti Aayog has recently come up with a paper depicting the growth of Indian agriculture with the aid of modern technologies. It showed how the increasing reliance on technology and adoption of technology in agriculture led to rise in production in agriculture. Let us look into impact of modern technology. So the factors of technology. The key factors are genetic, crop nutrition, crop protection and agronomic interventions. So these technologies is what we are going to focus upon. Genetics, crop nutrition, crop protection and agronomic intervention all contributing to rise in production levels. This is a technological intervention that we are talking about. Let us look into each topic one by one. Firstly, genetics. So now there is a talk about adoption of genetical modification. Earlier itself we have seen plant breeding technique where we have produced quality seeds that have the ability to produce more and also in terms of nutritional changes etc etc thus adding value to the product produced by the farmers. If you look into rice or wheat etc we are getting more output. One of the reasons is the development of high yielding varieties. Similarly now we are talking about genetically modified crops where we are modifying the genes of the crops to produce seeds that have capabilities like for example making it drought resistant or flood resistant or free from pest attacks by increasing their immunity powers etc. So we could modify it, modify the gene or we could see that certain qualities are uh, inculcated into the seeds through techniques like breeding. Next the development of the Bt cotton is itself as an example here. The Bt cotton adoption Bt uh, cotton cultivation led to rise in production of cotton by 40%. How? We are able to reduce the attack of the ballworm and thus led to the rise in yields. As you know, ballworm attack significantly impacts the output of the cotton. Next, we have wheat varieties such as IR8, Kush dwarf varieties, etc. That have, that have led to rise in production. Wheat production has increased in the green revolution. That itself is an indication. Now let us look into the crop nutrition. So one of the things that we have done in the technological enhancement or improvement is increase the nutrition that is available to the seeds or the plant to improve the output. So we have seen the rise in yields of rice and wheat especially due to high nutrition that we have pro provided to these plants, to these uh, rice fields, rice and wheat. Actually, these are the variety of grass, but trying to improve the nutrition intake of these uh, plants or whatever that is urea, which provides nitrogen. Similarly, we have phosphorus, etc. Macro and micronutrients intake of these plants to improve the production. 
and we have synthetic fertilizers that provide it nutrition that is we that is we are trying to provide it in an artificial manner then we have use of urea coated fertilizer as an example where the urea is coated with uh, neem neem which we call it as neem coated urea that slowly releases nitrogen which will be taken up by plants or whatever if, uh, crops we are planting in the agriculture farm next we have crop protection we are trying to protect crop from the pest diseases in weeds and for that we have techniques like integrated pest management integrated pest management involves not only organic way of pro uh, protecting these crops from the pest attack but also artificial way so we use pesticides as well as organic ways to improve the pest management solely relying on organic ways is unviable at the moment because of various reasons we need not venture into those reasons but integrated pest management seems to have better potential in terms of managing pests also trying to uh, reduce the toxicity which again and again is a debate with regards to usage of artificial ways of using uh, fertilizers or pesticides etc next agronomic intervention it is with regards to the technologies that use uh, drip irrigation and other ways to conserve water again and again we are talking we are seeing the debate of utilizing less water and that to use this water efficiently drip irrigation has the ability to reduce the water intake by for, by 50% by 50% which is not the case in the conventional way of utilizing irrigated irrigation water for uh, agriculture farms uh, in the state of punjab use of drip irrigation has found out to save 30% of water resources given the extent of water depletion levels in punjab it is a necessary it is a necessity to use this technology next we could see the impact of technology on in indian indian agriculture the rise in production due to the rise in adoption of the technology in indian agriculture let us look into the challenges the usage of high yielding varieties have pro produced more output at an unprecedented level but yet we are facing the issues the issue is over reliance on high yielding varieties that is actually leading to the genetic erosion we fear that the genetic diversity a genetic purity that was the case from earlier ways of choosing crop seeds etc that we are losing but because we are specifically exclusively focusing on the high yielding varieties rather than the diversity element that is present in the seeds which develop over a period of time climatologically geologically whatever might be the reason now if you are focusing exclusively on one particular seeds the genetic diversity is lost and this particular gene might not be in its purest form it might not withstand the time, test of the time etc those are all the fears that creep in while we rely exclusively on one seed and that ultimately reduces crop diversity as next high input requirements is one of the issue again and again seeing the rise in cost of productions why because we need costly artificial fertilizers pesticides etc and this input cost is necessary to actually get the required output with this technology next we have limited adaptability high yielding varieties are not suited for all the climates they adapt to such a certain climates thus this uh, reduces the ability to use these high yielding varieties in different regions within the country or around the world and that is why the crop diversity also comes into picture where various crops within that particular product that we are trying to develop it might be rice varieties the crop diversity within the rice variety could actually enable us to grow this variety in all the regions which is not possible in the case of high yielding variety if we solely focus on one product next mechanization is positive in terms of productivity and production but it has high initial investment costs it might not be viable to indian farmers given high extent of marginal and small farmers in india it might not be viable because of the size of the farms this also will lead to displacement of labor we are already seeing its consequences in terms of migration and impacting the demography of the urban areas also limiting the extent of livelihood opportunities in the 
rural areas. This is one of the fears among the rural population, which is excessively dependent on agriculture for their livelihood purposes. Next, drip irrigation, the challenges with drip irrigation. It too has high initial costs and the cost range from 20,000 rupees to 40,000 per acre. That, that in itself is a disincentive. Next, maintenance requirement, especially it requires knowledge and at the same time the costs. Thus, this will not encourage farmers to adopt these technologies if, if their ability to afford is low. Next is technical expertise and training. Technology adoption requires our ability to understand the technology. Given the low literacy rate in India, at the same time having literacy in itself is insufficient. We need to be well equipped to know the latest technologies like GPS enabled technology, like understanding certain applications, etc. This in itself doesn't provide the ability to absorb the technologies in the farmers. So for that purpose, we need to do more thorough work and give research to these farmers. So what do we do? The way forward is firstly region specific agriculture technologies but because the investments that we are presently doing in R&D in agriculture is low. Now because our budget is mostly focused on giving subsidies. Because there are other schemes where we are trying to provide inputs to the farmers but subsidies cost is far higher. We need to develop technologies not only technologies with regards to improving productivity, production, etc., that is seed quality improvement, but also equipments that are well suited for the Indian agroclimate. Then we have to establish Kisan call centers to extend training facilities to the farmers. The Kisan Vigyan Kendras also play this role. So the Kisan call centers and Kisan Vigyan Kendras could be used to generate awareness among the farmers about the latest technologies and the ways to use these technologies. These are already in place, but we need to increase the number of these channels. Next, we have to have custom hiring centers to see that the farm equipment or technology is affordable. We could also look into cooperative practices where the farmers in unison forming a cooperative could afford technologies. Next, we have to have supportive policy and framework to facilitate technology adoption and maintain price regulation. Right? So, I have to make farm imports affordable. So, in this way, we could see that or we could ensure the increased adoption of technology. So, this completes the article. Now, let us look into another article. This article deals with monetary policy transmission. What is monetary policy transmission? It is nothing but we will try to see that the policy decisions taken by RPI is being implemented in reality or not. So RPI tries to control the interest rates of the economy. It might be interest rates at which bank lends loans to the market or borrowers or what the ultimate reasons for monetary policy transmission is to see that the inflation rate in the economy is at a particular rate. Inflation to be controlled is done by the Reserve Bank of India. Of course, it is not the actions of RBI itself that decides the inflation rates, but government's fiscal deficit or fiscal policies also together will decide the inflation rates. Inflation means the rise in price of the goods and services. So, ultimate aim of the RPI as per the recent uh, arrangement between the Reserve Bank of India and the Government of India is to control the price levels in the economy, that is, control the inflation. How it will control the inflation and how RBI is able to control the inflation through the recent changes in its instruments used for controlling the inflation is what we are going to see in this article. So the title of the topic is Dynamic of Monetary Policy Transmission. So the relevance of the topic is transmission is a problem of resource mobilization through finance marketing. Okay, but because transmission of the monetary policy is important for the companies, for the government, etc. Ultimately, economy also revolves around the inflation levels.
because through inflation we'll be able to know whether economy is growing or economy is booming etc etc and topic is relevant to gs paper 3 indian economy and issues related to planning mobilization of resources the context the context is monetary policy the country is in a tightening mode that is tightening mode means we are trying to tighten the liquidity liquidity is nothing but money flow in the market we are trying to see that the money flow in the market is as per the requirement of the market or else what happens is we'll could witness inflation or reduction in inflation rate so rbi's aim at the moment is to control the uh, inflation rate between 2 to 6 percent so money flow in the market should be such that the inflation rate is from 2 to 4, 6 percent not below 2 not above 6 that is the task of the rbi rbi is recently tightening the liquidity flow in the market why because of the inflation trends that we are witnessing in the economy so let us look into the reasons for the recent inflation trends that is higher inflation rates one is the ukraine conflict because of the russia ukraine war we are seeing turmoil in the global economies possible outcome of the war we don't know how it impacts the prices of the oil where russia is one of the important supplier of the fossil fuel and the commodities exported by the ukraine all these could impact the output of these countries and ultimately impact the inflation these are actually causing inflationary trends at the global level given the globalization of the economies of the present world then we have commodity prices that are rising one of the reasons for rising commodity prices is russia ukraine conflict added to it the global economies various economies europe USA, China, etc., witnessing a slowdown in their economies, a slowdown in the economies, and despite that, we are witnessing higher inflation rates in the economies. So this is a cause of worry, as India is integrated with the rest of the world, it is impacting India as well. In supply chain disruption, that is how the modern manufacturing sector is connected with one country to the other country in terms of establishing firms in different countries so as to see that the product is manufactured through subcontracting or in other ways the supply chain is nothing but production chain in this production chain is diversified and is placed in various countries ultimately to efficiently produce the commodities and these disruptions, for example, if any of the country, of a particular country, if any of the country is not able to perform well, or it is not able to provide an environment to produce that product, then it will impact the rest of the supply chain. Because without the output of different firms engaging in particular production activity, then its ability to finally produce a product gets impacted. For example, car, automobile requires production of various parts and a particular company might establish firms in different countries depending upon the specialization or labor requirement or technological know-how etc if any of the country is not able to perform well on account of various circumstances that might not be in control of the global economy or is to do, do with the situation of that particular country it will ultimately impact its ability to produce for example we have seen the issue of semiconductor supply that ultimately impacted production of electronic goods, automobiles, etc., etc. Thus, this disruption is also impacting the output at the global level and thus contributing to inflationary trends. Because if you are creating a lower supply, it will impact the demand. Demand uh, obviously is uh, either it will be same or it will be higher, or it will go down very uh, rarely. And thus, what we are witnessing is the inflation trend. Then volatility in global financial market as we are witnessing inflation in various countries as we have already seen. And the tightening of the liquidity is not only observed in India, but different countries as well. For example, United States, European countries. Now, what RBI was successful to do in the recent years is to control inflation through various instrumentalities that are used by it to see that 
money flow in the market is so and so as per the requirement of the market so as to control the inflation the important instrumentalities are external benchmark based lending rate so what external benchmark based lending rate does is it restricts banks in deciding the interest rates what happened earlier is interest rates of the particular banks are decided by the banks on the basis of certain criteria now what rbi has done is it has connected this interest rates with the external benchmark rather than on the basis of the dynamics of the banks that are operating and extending loans at a particular interest rates now banks must base their interest rates on how the rbi decides various policies for example repo rate repo rate is decided by rbi and depending upon the repo rate the interest rates of the banks vary and thus what it does is it gives us predictability reserve bank of india will be able to direct the interest rates of the economy and on that basis it will direct the money flow in the economy the higher interest rates obviously leads to lower money supply that means lower liquidity why because if the interests are higher the extent of money borrowed from the market goes down because of the excess interest rates or highest interest higher interest rates so in this way it will be able to control the money flow or liquidity in the market then calibrated normalization of surplus liquidity rbi through his recent innovation in monetary policy is squeezing the money or excess capital or excess money with the banks it is squeezing this money so as to control the liquidity in the market we are going to see how it is able to achieve it in addition to it what we are witnessing is the robust credit growth it is not only the control of the liquidity we are witnessing the rise in credit growth as well and this is due to the way in which rbi is able to operate through the usage of its instruments so we are going to see how what is calibrated normalization of surplus liquidity the current policy as we already seen is tightening that is controlling the liquidity in the market and how it is able to do is higher magnitude of increase in the policy repo rate so repo rate used as an instrument to control the money flow and it is increasing at higher level that ultimately reduces the money flow in the market repo rate is the rate at which banks borrow money from rbi if this interest rate or if this rate is increased obviously the cost of borrowing of the banks from the rbi is going to rise that ultimately reduces the inflation and the other thing is that added to it it is undertaking calibrated liquidity management to squeeze excess capital from the banks through various interest rates and nothing but through various instrumentalities that ultimately decide the interest rates the in instrumentalities that i am referring to here is repo rate marginal standing facility standard deposit facility etc okay so we are going to see how how is rbi able to do it firstly whatever the ways that rbi utilizes to control the money flow in the market is called as liquidity adjustment facility before 2022 the upper ceiling was marginal standing facility and the lower end was the reverse repo rate so these two were primarily the reason through which or primarily the instruments through which rbi was able to control money flow in the market marginal standing facility the interest rate charged on marginal standing facility is greater than reverse repo rate if banks limit with regards to their ability to borrow money from the rbi on repo rate has been reached then the banks approach rbi to borrow money at marginal standing facility rate so marginal standing facility's interest rate is greater than at repo rate for example 100 rupees is the extent of money that a bank could borrow from rbi 
a repo rate and beyond it bank has to borrow bank requires to borrow then it has to use other instruments like msf and msf charges that is the instrument of msf is costlier when compared to repo rate whereas reverse repo rate is the rate at which banks park their excess or surplus liquid with rbi so they park their money with rbi in order to earn interest rates obviously this rate is lower than repo rate msf etc now because if this is higher then obviously banks will prefer to deposit their money with rbi rather than borrow money from rbi to earn money by lending that money to the the consumers now what happened is major standing facility now stands at upper limit but at lower limit what we are witnessing is standard deposit facility this is charged at repo minus 0.25% so now the banks are utilizing this instrument to deposit their money with rbi and they are earning more money when compared to the earlier case where reverse repo was at the lower end thus what is happening is rbi is able to attract the deposits from the banks if rbi is able to attract the deposits that is banks are depositing their money in rbi obviously what happens is the liquidity in the market is being controlled so in this way rbi is able to control the money flow in the market this adjustment is called as calibrated monetary tightening and this is how we are able to tighten the liquid such that inflation is under control and rbi is able to utilize its instruments to control which was difficult in the earlier case so this completes the topic now let us look into another topic this article is on model code of conduct recently uh, the elections as you know are due in telangana the government of telangana has announced the implementation of the scheme raitu bandhu and it was felt by the election commission of india that it is a violation of model code of conduct based on certain model code of conducts rules so uh, thus it gave a directive to the government of telangana that it is a violation of the model code of conduct in this article we are going to see what this model code of conduct is why is there a need for implementation of model code of conduct model code of conduct the title of the topic is election commission stops telangana farmer aid scheme so it stopped the implementation of telangana farmer aid scheme which is the raitu bandhu scheme the relevance of the topic we are going to learn about raitu bandhu scheme which is one of the famous schemes in the india with regards to implementation at the state level obviously mcoc rules next challenges in implementation of it the syllabus responsibility of various constitutional bodies here the election commission of india how it deals with the model code of conduct we have questions in the past regarding election commission i discuss the role of election commission of india in the light of the evolution of model code of conduct thus its relevance in mains examination is also high the context context is election commission on monday with your permission for raitu bandhu scheme because a minister has announced its implementation in the state that is a possibility that there is a uh, election commission has intervened because it has felt that it has a possibility to uh, influence the voters thus garner votes in the name of certain welfare schemes that will ultimately give more advantage to the ruling party rather than the opposition parties thus we need to have a mechanism where even opposition parties are able to influence the voters as equally or as fairly as the ruling does rather than giving a slight edge to the ruling party that is why we need the codes like model code of conduct to see that the election are conducted in a free and fair manner now let us look into raitu bandhu scheme as you know schemes of the state level are also important both for the sake of preliminary and mains examination you could also cite this along uh, as a value addition to the mains answer Uh, so that it will fetch more marks 
So the objective is timely cash grants. We need to give certain incentives to the farmer so that farming would become viable. As you know, farming is in crisis all the time in India. Why? Because of the structure of the agriculture itself. As you know, most of the farmers are small and marginal farmers. Assistance to make agriculture profitable is important. That is one of the reasons for Raitu Bandhu scheme. It is to ensure that they do not fall in debt trap. It is cash grant and it is extended to farmers on per acre basis. And there is one interesting thing about this scheme is it is extended to all the farmers irrespective of land size, size of the land, irrespective of size of land. And the implementation is done obviously by Telangana government and it is both for Rabi and Kharif crop, thus it is extended to the farmers two times a year. As we said, there is no limit to number of acres. Now, why did Election Commission of India cancel the permission? The reason is, firstly, even though the government which is in power will continue in power during the period of elections, it, there are certain restrictions imposed upon its operations as I said, to conduct elections in a fee, free and fair manner. One is no publicity to the scheme that it is implementing because it will have undue advantage and influence the voters. And public functions should not be conducted so as to highlight its implementation. Okay. And no political functionary should attend the implementation of the, func uh, implementation of the schemes so that public will be able to notice that the government is implementing so and so scheme. Violation ultimately led to Election Commission's decision to stop implementation of the scheme. What is Model Code of Conduct? The idea of the Model Code of Conduct was firstly conceived during the conducting of uh, Kerala elections in the year 1960. Later on, though Model Code of Conduct has been evolving from 1960, the strictest implementation has been initiated by Election Commission of India in the 1991. Why? Because of the violations of the political parties to influence the voters. It might be the indulgence in corruption activities or others. Somehow, they are trying to influence the voters in an unfair manner. And thus, Election Commission of India has taken Model Code of Conduct seriously and the strictest implementation has been started in the year 1991, from the year 1991. Now, when is Model Code of Conduct operational? It starts its implementation that is, Election Commission starts implementing Model Code of Conduct right from the date where the schedule of the election is announced. The important rules of Model Code of Conduct, these are not that important, but it is required for us to give as a perspective that so and so things are included in the Model Code of Conduct that need thorough examination. For political parties, minister can't mix official visit with other visits. Why? Because there is a possibility that he will use that official visit for electoral purposes. And you cannot use official resources why? because the government in power obviously will be having an advantage and you misuse of public resources for election purposes is not correct practice. It is nothing but conflict of interest. And using it for electoral politics is itself a violation of model code of conduct. And you should not announce financial grants during the period of, uh, a period of implementation of model code of conduct and regarding welfare schemes of course government of the states or government of India is allowed to implement the existing schemes but uh, seeing that usage of the schemes for the campaigning purpose etc is not allowed criticism of the political parties is allowed but is on valid grounds using of caste communal feelings etc is not at all allowed because that will ultimately create rifts they polarize the environment for vote bank politics and ultimately impact the peace and harmony and this is also unfair practice and you have to inform the local police station before starting any meeting or gathering etc. Added to it, electronic and print media allow, uh, usage is allowed but that shouldn't be used for official purpose that is official media, electronic and print media advertisement promoting political parties at public expenses is not allowed. Because many times we see political parties use the platform of government to uh, to actually promote their political parties. Obviously, political parties are the one who form the government 
at the state level as well as the central level. They need marketing. Why they need marketing? Because to generate awareness, to generate behavioral changes in the citizens regarding their agenda. Might be, for example, to promote uh, nutritional needs of the citizens, changing dietary habits, etc. For example, but that should not be misused as a platform for political uh, advertisement, politically promoting a particular party. Recently, certain editions have been witnessed in the model code of conduct. These are opinion and exit poll related. Opinion polls are uh, strictly prohibited before 48 hours of election date. At the same time, exit polls are also not allowed prior to the polling date. After polling, one could give their exit polls. That is the probable results of a particular election. Next is print media advertisement is prohibited on polling day and one day prior without pre-certification. You have to get certification from election commission. And then government advertisements on featuring political functionaries during elections is also prohibited. The drawbacks of model code of conduct. Government cannot take up new initiatives while model code of conduct is in operation. Why? Because as you know, we have already seen in the previous slides. And that ultimately impacts its ability to administer the state in a efficient manner. That is one of the reasons why central government presently is talking about or is proposing the idea of one nation, one election. Because continual election in India, in the state level or at the local level or at the national level is hampering the functioning of the governments because of the operation of the model code of conduct. Why? Because there is a need for certain restrictions in place for uh, seeing that the elections are conducted in a free and fair manner. Now the challenges in implementing model code of conduct. Firstly, it has no official legal backing either by the central law or state law. That in itself gives enough room for election commission to manual whether to decide this is violation or that is violation. So this decision or discretion of the election commission leads to questioning from the opposition parties that election commission of India is not operating in a free and fair manner and it is not treating everyone equally that is the ruling party as well as the opposition party especially uh, the opposition parties target the central government added to it only three member body is in charge of implementing model code of conduct to such a huge country so we need certain administrative changes so that we could efficiently implement model code of conduct then there is no proper legal backing as we already seen there is no legal backing thus there is criticism from opposition there are many reforms that are required there is clear codification which is required why we need to be we need to be able to identify the restrictions etc clearly and thus implementation will become easier and also violation could be easily understood manifested by the political parties so and so violation is being done and thus we could see that certain proceedings could be undertaken so as to see the implementation is done in a stricter manner and added to it difficulty in enforcing provisions like banning money liquor distribution for voters etc many additions are required, many modifications are required and model code of conduct implementation is important for the democracy of the country. Now let us look into another article. In this article we are going to see a defense mechanism in our embryonic stage of development where a particular virus that is HGRV is able to attack unwanted cells ultimately protecting the embryo and understanding this evolution our development of embryo is important because it has applications on therapeutic aspects like regenerative medicine and also how to see that we will be able to utilize pluripotent cells with their full might that is how the pluripotent cells could be utilized for various surgeries where we are in need of tissues like heart related specific cells or uh, skin cells etc etc. So the title of the topic is Mechanism that removes unfit cells before you are born. The relevance of the topic, inner cell mass, HERVH that is, human endogenous retrovirus. 
for mains awareness in the field of biotechnology. In the previous years, we have seen questions related to stem cells. Stem cells, we are going to see how this is related to the topic that is under discussion. The context, the context of the topic is we are going to learn about the embryonic development where HERVH, that is human endogenous retrovirus, plays a crucial role in defense mechanism. Firstly, we need to learn what inner cell mass is. Inner cell mass is found in human embryo where after fertilization, within 5 to 6 days, a group of cells, that is inner cell mass, is formed and the stage is referred to as blastocyst and these inner cell mass are nothing but a group of pluripotent cells. We are going to see about these inner cell mass in the subsequent slides. And in these all ICM cells are not of consequence to the embryonic development or embryo development. Certain cells develop the organs whereas certain cells are not important actually impact the embryo that is harm the embryo by their movements. That is why they are eliminated in the early stage of the development itself. So we are going to see this defense mechanism played by HERVH virus as we go along in these slides. As you could see, the inner cell mass has the ability to develop into various cells, nerves, muscle, bone, liver, etc. That is, inner cell mass is a group of pluripotent cells. They are referred to as stem cells. So, inner cell mass, as we have already seen, is a group of pluripotent cells. And the formation is observed during the stage of blastocyst. And if you look into the divisions, inner cell mass is divided into two, epiblast and hypoblast. And epiblast and hypoblast again form three primary germ layers which are ectoderm, mesoderm and endoderm. So this is ectoderm, mesoderm and endoderm. And we have amniotic sac has the ability to protect the embryo. And we have yolk sac which provides the required nutrient for the development of embryo. Now let us look into the non committed cells. As you have seen, all the ICM cells not of consequence for the embryonic development. Certain cells actually have the ability to create harm or to do harm to the embryo, which are non committed cells. And these non committed cells, through their expression of transposons or jumping genes, cause the harm to the embryo. And as a defense mechanism, our human body has been integrated with this virus which protects us from these harmful cells within the ICM. And this has entered into human evolution in the initial stage of human evolution and it has been through with human body protecting the embryo from the attack of the unwanted cell. So, HERVH acts as a defense mechanism against the unwanted cells. Thus, our embryo development will be healthier. This will ultimately have the potential in theoretic applications of regenerative medicine. Regenerative medicine in which we use pluripotent stem cells or stem cells. As you know, the application of stem cells is increasing as the biotechnology is improving in its ability to utilize various technologies, pluripotent cell has the ability to differentiate into various specialized cells, specialized stem cells. And these ultimately transform into organs. It might be skin or others. Thus, HERVH is important for us to have effective regenerative medicine technology. So this completes the article. Now let us look into prelims questions which are based upon the article that have been discussed. Coming to the first question, 
benchmark prime lending rate system of loan pricing was introduced in the place of base rate system of prime of loan pricing this is false now we have external benchmark prime lending rate system we already seen how external benchmark prime lending rate system is important for monetary policy transmission and then the liquidity adjustment facility under the current monetary policy has the reverse repo as its lower ceiling presently what we have seen recently is banks are utilizing standard deposit facility that is sdf through which they are parking their money with the rbi and we already seen this in the article so this too is false choose the correct statement from the above the answer is d none of the above next question consider the following statements regarding model code of conduct so we seen the election commission applies or implements a model code of conduct to see that the elections are conducted in a free and fair manner first model code of conduct is legally enforced by law this is false as we have seen there is no legal backing to the model code of conduct which is one of the criticism next is a political leader calling voters to perform their democratic duty to vote on polling day is violation of model code of conduct this is false obviously because mere calling on mere campaigning to garner votes and educating the voters to come up and vote is not a violation next exit poll should be published only after completion of all phase of election this is true this is one of the important recent changes that we have witnessed cvigil is a mobile app brought by election commission of india for citizens to report violations of moral code of conduct this too is true now choose the correct statements the correct statement are 3 and 4 so the answer is d next question consider the following statement with respect to inner cell mass we have seen about the inner cell mass in the topic inner cell mass is a group of cells in the early human embryo that are pluripotent this is true it forms within 5 to 6 days next the icm forms within the blastocyst stage which occurs approximately 5 to 6 days this is true next non committed cells in the icm are distinct population that does not contribute to the embryo development in fact we have seen the non committed cells being harmful to the embryo development so this too is true how many of the above given statements are true the answer is all three c fourth question which of the following statement is not challenge associated with the use of modern technologies environmental pollution due to excessive fertilizers use yes there is environmental potish, uh, pollution due to excessive fertilizers use this is true but could you refer this as a challenge to agriculture is a question we'll look into it after observing the options next synthetic fertilizers are inefficient difficult to store and transport compared to traditional fertilizers this is false next development of bt cotton led to fall in cotton yields by 40% this too is false so 2 and 3 are not challenges synthetic fertilizers transportation is not that difficult and thus second one is false and third one is false so choose the correct answer from the options given the answer is 2 and 3 b consider the following statements related to the supreme court firstly under article 145 the salary allowances pensions and privileges of the judges of the supreme court shall be determined by the parliament this is true next is article 143 deals with the power of the president to consult the court and its opinion is binding its opinion is not binding in on all the cases so this is false next Article one forty five three of the Constitution provides for setting up of a Constitution bench. It must have a minimum of three judges. This is false. It must have a minimum of five judges. Next, only the Supreme Court shall have the power of punishment for contempt of court. This too is false, as you know. Even High Court and even the subordinate courts has the power. 
Which of the above statements is or are incorrect? The answer is 2, 3, 4, D. Now let us look into mains practice question. Discuss the potential impact of establishing a permanent constitutional bench in the Supreme Court in ensuring the efficiency, transparency and credibility of the Indian judiciary. So, we will look into the establishment of a permanent constitutional bench, which is one of the important steps that is to be taken to improve the adjudication of constitutional cases, which is not happening at the moment because of the floodgate of cases that are being uh, adjudicated by the Supreme Court. In the introduction, write down with examination of the constitution of constitutional bench under Article 145.3. Mention this article. Mentioning article is important. And write down the constitutional mandate as well. That is, ultimately the Supreme Court has the power to look into the constitutionality of cases. It might be a legislation or it might be a constitutional amendment that deals ultimately with the violation of the provisions of the constitution or whether it is complying with the provisions of the constitution. In the body write down, the case load that the present Supreme Court is facing, the pendency of the cases and the burden it is facing. Thus, it requires us to mention specialization in terms of constitutional benches, that is seeing that the judge's qualification is as per the requirement of the particular case and allocation of the cases to the benches should be such that it shouldn't be of any uh, subjectivity on the part of the way in which the cases are allocated. I mean the present mechanism where CJA is a master of roster is deciding the constitution of the constitutional bench in which various judges together participate in the proceedings of the case. So what we require is a fair mechanism of constitutional benches. Highlight the lack of explicit categorization between the constitution and non-constitutional matters that actually warrants us to proceed or see that there is a system where constitutional benches are created to deal with the constitutional cases. Now what to do is analyze the potential influence of this structural change. Whether this structural change is important, whether the constitution permits this structural change or how it impacts the basic structure of the Supreme Court in terms of it being a highest court of appeal. Whether its function of highest court of appeal that is as an appellate court will be impacted on account of its focus on constitutional cases etc. And then also write down the public perception and confidence because presently the confidence on the judiciary is low on account of its subjectivity element involved in constituting constitutional benches. Also discuss how the creation of permanent bench might improve the consistency and predictability of the constitutional decisions Why? because in this we could bring in credibility we can bring in expertise, we can bring in objectivity, etc. Ultimately, all this improve the functioning of judiciary as well as adjudication of cases efficiently. In conclusion, write down, the successful implementation requires careful planning and consideration of various factors. It is how to transform the structure of the Supreme Court. Ultimately, impacting the way CJ need to operate in the composition of the constitutional bench and non-constitutional bench if possible and number of benches categorization etc. Thus seeing that the structural changes are of some consequence. So this completes today's discussion. Please do like, share and subscribe our channel. Thank you.